Without further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Matthew Skinner. Matthew is a Senior Officer in Marketing and Communications at the Faculty of Engineering and Information Technologies. He has over 10 years of experience delivering, delivering marketing, media and communications insight across the sports and higher education sectors. His exposure to and passion of comic books as a medium spans over 30 years. Matthew completed his Bachelor of Arts with Honours in 2006, presenting his thesis on the literary history of comic books in America between 1938 and 1975, and more recently his Master of Media Practice in 2010. Today Matthew discusses the origin of Marvel Comics' flagship character, Spider-Man, seen for the first time within the pages of this anthology book, Amazing Fantasy No. 15. Please join me in welcoming Matthew. Oh, thank you so much for taking the time today out of your um, busy schedules to come down and listen to me as I talk about Amazing Fantasy issue 15. So I want to set the scene for you. You know, a lot of things happened in 1962. The Cuban Missile Crisis, the first transatlantic TV transmission via the Telstar satellite, Marilyn Monroe sings Happy Birthday to US President JFK, and Marvel Comics' anthology book, Amazing Fantasy, issue 15, by co-creators Stan Lee and Steve Ditko, hit the newsstands. It's this last point that I will be discussing today. It introduced to the world the tale of teenager Peter Parker, who, when bitten by a radioactive spider, became the superhero Spider-Man. Now, Lee and Ditko needed just 11 pages to tell their tale. It was a tightly plotted and scripted story that covers nearly every important part of the character's mythology. We're introduced to teenager Peter Parker, who enjoys his studies rather than the company of his own classmates. We also learn that his only living relatives are Uncle Ben and Aunt May. In the story, Peter attends a demonstration on radioactivity, as you do, as part of a science excursion. It's here that he gets bitten by a radioactive spider who conveniently gets doused by a radioactive ray. Heading home, Peter's nearly hit by a car that manages to leap in time to safety. He ends up sticking to the side of a brick building. He realises then that he's inherited the spider's strength, agility, and climbing ability. So what will he do? Wanting to profit from his powers, he battles a wrestler in the ring for a cash prize whilst wearing a hoodie to naturally conceal his face. The audience loves it, as does a television producer who just so happens to give Peter his business card. Peter stitches together at home his spider-themed costume. He creates some sticky web fluid and web shooters. Spider-Man, as we now recognise him, is born. Spider-Man later appears on the television show and becomes an instant celebrity. One evening though, while backstage, he watches on and does nothing as a policeman gives chase to a thief. The policeman asks, why did you not do anything? Peter replies, that's your job. I'm through being pushed around by anyone. Days pass until Peter one day returns home to discover that a burglar has killed Uncle Ben. Learning that the police have the burglar cornered in a deserted warehouse, Peter suits up and swings away, seeking revenge. He confronts the burglar. They fight and Peter knocks him unconscious. It's at this point that Peter discovers the burglar is the thief that he just so happened didn't stop the other night at that TV production show. He leaves the burglar webbed up for the police, realising that if he'd acted earlier, his Uncle Ben would still be alive. He learns that with great power, there must also come great responsibility. Now, the first person responsible for this story is Stanley Martin Lieber, born in New York City in 1922 and with aspirations to someday write the great American novel. In 1939, he joined Timely Comics, the precursor to Marvel Comics, as an assistant. The publisher there, 
is his cousin-in-law, Martin Goodman. His first writing job is within the pages of Captain America Comics Issue 3 under the pseudonym Stan Lee. He was embarrassed to use his actual real name and have it associated with comic books. He was still holding out for that great American novel, but that novel never came. Lee instead remained within the comic book industry and rose up the ranks to become writer and editor of Timely, which later became Atlas Comics, which is now ultimately known as Marvel. Now, the other person responsible is Stephen J. Ditko, who was born in Johnston, Pennsylvania in 1927. Wanting to pursue a career in art, in 1950 he moves to New York City and studies at the Cartoonists and Illustrators School. He was here, it was here that Ditko, as a student, first met Lee, who'd been invited as a guest speaker. In 1955, he joins Atlas Comics, beginning his working relationship with Lee, collaborating, collaborating together on a run-of-the-mill monster stories and other fantastical stories within the pages of various anthology books, including Amazing Adventures, as well as its later name change to Amazing Adult Fantasy. Now, to understand what happens next, let me share with you what had come before. The genre of superheroes within the pages of comic books started when Jerry Siegel and Joe Shuster gave life to Superman within the pages of Action Comics issue number one, published by National Allied Publications, which is now known as DC Comics in 1938. Readers loved it and superheroes had arrived on the scene. In 1939, Timely Comics, overseen, like I said, by Lee's cousin-in-law Goodman, published Marvel Comics issue one. It too was a hit, and before long, Goodman authorised more comic book titles featuring superheroes to be printed. Comic books featuring superheroes continued throughout most of the 1940s, in part because of World War II, where superheroes kept fighting the Axis powers. However, as the war came to an end, so too did the popularity of these heroes. During the 1950s, Timely became known as Atlas and was publishing such comic book genre stories about westerns, horror, science fiction and war. However, untimely business decisions caused the cancellation of many of these titles as the decade rolled on. Something needed to change for Goodman. This same period had seen National Allied Publications, now known as DC Comics, reintroduce their contingent of superheroes to much fanfare. In 1961, Goodman heard how well DC Comics' Justice League of America was selling and essentially wanted to replicate this. He instructed Lee to make it happen. Lee had entertained during this period the actual thought of quitting comic books entirely but was persuaded by his wife Joan to honour Goodman's demands. She told Stan, though, to write it the way he would want to read a story if he were the comic buyer. The result was The Fantastic Four, a collaboration between Lee and artist Jack Kirby, known as the godfather of comics, that ushered in Marvel Comics later on that same year. Sales figures showed it was welcomed by readers who also sent lots and lots of fan mail bombarding Lee's desk with demands for more superhero titles. So Lee and Kirby created the Hulk, who debuted inside the pages of Incredible Hulk issue 1 in early 1962. But I'm going to be talking about something else that happened in 1962. Amazing Fantasy Issue 15. Spider-Man was a radical shift from normal conventions of what a superhero comic book should have looked like at the time of its debut. It was unheard of for the lead superhero to be a teenager, yet that's what Spider-Man was. Prior to then, it had widely been the norm for teenagers to serve as sidekicks to more older and experienced adults. 
It was believed the teenage character served as a reflection of the actual teenage reader. An easier character, they believed, for the student or the child or the teenager to relate to. It was part of the reason why Robin was introduced inside the pages of Detective Comics issue 38 as Batman Psychic. That and the bright costume actually, you know, contrasted to the blacks and the greys and the blues. Goodman was not quite receptive to the idea of a teenage hero taking centre stage when Lee pitched him this idea. A teenager can't be the hero. Teenagers can only be sidekicks. He also thought the audience might be put off by that spider motif, something that Martin described as grotesque. Lee knew he had to get Goodman's approval, and ultimately he did, with the, agree with the agreement being that the character would appear in the soon-to-be-cancelled series Amazing Adult Fantasy, now known as Amazing Fantasy. Lee initially approached Kirby about drawing the character. The artist turned in five pages about a hero who, with the help of a magic ring, transformed into an adult hero named Spider-Man. Lee admitted when he saw Kirby's work, though, that Kirby wasn't the guy for Spider-Man. I didn't want the character to look like your usual superhero. Lee wanted to avoid his protagonist being too handsome, muscular, and heroic looking regular traits of Kirby's artwork. Instead, Lee opted for Ditko, the regular artist on Amazing Adult Fantasy, who had a penchant for just drawing more vulnerable characters. Lee provided Ditko with a short synopsis of what would eventually become the story we're familiar with. Ditko came back with a story as well as the character's red and blue costume that we all know and love. Ditko also drew the original cover art. However, Lee rejected it, deciding Kirby pencil a cover that Ditko ink, outlining the pencil in black ink. I think I had Jack sketch out a cover for it because I always had a lot of confidence in Jack's covers, Lee once said. Covers were important to Lee only because you got one chance on the newsstands to make that decision whether you would purchase it or not. So it had to be good. Now, observations between the two covers, aside from the different penciling styles of both artists, include the copy lettering in Ditko's cover is used on Kirby's version. The exception being the Spider-Man there. Kirby's version has the amazing fantasy logo designed differently. As we can see, Kirby's version also shows background clouds and motion streaks created with color and without ink lines. Along here, compared to the streaking lines. This allowed Spider-Man to be the central focus of the cover. Kirby's version also had the buildings, balloons and captions shifted around to eliminate cluttering. In my opinion, this allowed Spider-Man to swing freely and not hit anybody. Now, several months later, Marvel received its sales figures for Amazing Fantasy issue 15. It had been the top selling issue of the title. Readers related to the everyman tale of Peter Parker and the fact characters did not lead a perfect life. It said Goodman himself ran to Lee, shouting, do you remember that Spider-Man character of yours that we both liked? Why don't you do a series about him? In March 1963, the amazing Spider-Man hit newsstands. The Lee and Ditko collaboration within the amazing Spider-Man was an instant success. By the mid-1960s, it was clearly amongst Marvel's best-selling titles alongside the Fantastic Four. Like the Fantastic Four and all other Marvel titles at the time, Amazing Spider-Man was the product of a writer-artist collaboration known as the Marvel Method. You see, there are several ways to create a comic book issue. The most common being that the writer writes a script, 
that explains what's happening on each page and in includes the dialogue. This allows the artist to draw the pages based on the script. The Marvel method though leaves the layout of the pages up to the artist who's working from a more generalized plot that derived between the artist and the scripter. Once the pages are drawn, the scripter goes back in and simply adds the dialogue. The Lee and Ditko collaboration saw Spider-Man fight criminals and burglars and also introduce readers to such villains as the Vulture, Dr. Octopus and the Green Goblin. The collaboration was magic in the eyes of the reader. Behind the scenes though, Lee and Ditko had actually stopped speaking to one another. They hadn't in fact been on speaking terms for quite a while. It had gotten to the point where editorial and art changes were being handled through intermediaries. Furthermore, one story blames a disagreement over the Green Goblin's civilian identity as the catalyst for Ditko to quit Marvel altogether after just 38 issues. The Green Goblin had first appeared in Amazing Spider-Man issue 14 and subsequently began causing problems for the title's hero whenever he appeared. However, the identity of the villain had remained a mystery, leaving readers to guess who might be under the green mask. It's said Ditko may have wanted the Green Goblin's identity to possibly be a non-entity to create a sense of realism in the world of Peter Parker. Others suggested he wanted someone previously introduced in an e earlier issue, someone such as Peter's boss, J. Jonah Jameson at the Daily Bugle. Either way, Lee opted instead for the villain to be revealed eventually as Norman Osborn, the millionaire businessman who just so happened to be the father of Peter's college friend, Harry Osborn. This revelation happened in Amazing Spider-Man issue 39, the very first issue after the departure of Ditko in issue 38. There have been suggestions that Ditko had intended for Osborne to actually be the villain all along, though that would be revealed at a later date. Unfortunately, we'll never know this for sure, nor the real reason for the pair's fallout. In 2003, Lee was quoted as saying, I never knew Steve on a personal level. Ditko claimed it was in fact Lee who had broken off contact and disputed the long-held belief about the revealing of the Green Goblin civilian identity, that there were no problems between us concerning the Green Goblin or anything else from before issue 25 to my final issues. Ditko's successor on the title, John Romita, in 2010 said during a deposition how he recalled Lee and Ditko ending up not being able to work together because they disagreed on almost everything, including the characters. Marvel, however, did announce via its weekly information page in Fantastic Four issue 52 that Steve recently told us he was leaving for personal reasons. After all these years, we're sorry to see him go and we wish the talented guy all the success with his future endeavors. While we don't know the exact fallout, what we do know is the whereabouts of the actual artwork drawn by Ditko inside the pages of Amazing Fantasy issue 15. It's housed inside the United States Library of Congress. It caused quite the stir when the artwork simply showed up out of the blue in 2008, as the artwork is believed to have long been missing from Marvel's warehouse since the late 1970s. Some say it was possibly stolen. Now, Jim McLaughlin, a contributor to pop culture website newsarama.com, went to great lengths trying to piece this puzzle together. In his article, published earlier in 2019 for the website, McLaughlin interviewed Sarah Duke, the curator of popular and applied graphic art at the Library of Congress. Duke recounts receiving a cold call, simply out of the blue, asking if she wanted the art for Amazing Fantasy issue 15. She instinctively accepted, because you're not going to say no to a free gift, saying she would love the donation. She was unaware, though, 
at what was actually being donated. So she decided to look it up. She describes it as a big double take moment. There was a catch to the donation though. The donor's identity was to remain anonymous. Duke revealed that the donor was not Lee, nor was it Ditko, nor was it Mary Severin, Marvel's production artist at the time that the artwork went missing. Duke revealed though that Ditko knew that the art was coming to the Library of Congress and had given the donation his blessing. The original artwork of Amazing Fantasy issue 15 actually contains the written dialogue between Lee and Ditko as they collaborated to create Spider-Man. In Duke's words, there's a real dialogue between Stan Lee and Steve Ditko that show they were both very creative forces in the creation of Spider-Man. Today, Marvel's executive editor and senior vice president of publishing, Tom Brevort, has gone out of his way to break down this original artwork in great detail. You can find it on his personal website, The Tom Brevoort Experience. He has also compared it page by page with the artwork seen in the published edition of Amazing Fantasy issue 15. To summarize on just some of his observations, the Spider-Man logo that you see at the top is the only thing remaining from Steve Ditko's original cover. A caption at the bottom of page two of the artwork appears to have a note to the printer that says, Bill, shoot this page two, shoot to the stripper. But why? Now, Brevot purports that this page may not have been intended for original inclusion, only to be added later, or that the loss, it was actually lost at the printers, only to be found and inserted in later. Now, I don't have the artwork for page three, but I did discuss earlier on how when Spider-Man, uh, Peter first found his powers, he nearly gets hit by the car and he jumps to the side and sticks onto the brick wall. Now, there's actually a really, really funny, humorous note that's been erased on page three of the artwork. It's from Stan Lee to Steve Ditko, and he writes, Steve, make this a covered sedan, no arms hanging out. Don't imply wild, reckless driving. <laughs> On page eight, a possible extra panel may have been erased where panel four is now. Now you can't see it on the screens, but I did zoom in and you do actually see some pencil tracings. It's very faint and it seems to be the outline of a policeman's head, which may have led to what would be panel five. So you're introducing the policeman earlier to show that chase scene with the thief. There's also an erased note in panel two that kind of alludes to Stan telling Steve, stop making the burglar smile. Brevoort guesses that uh, Lee may have found some objections with this, but it was still kept in the final version. Brevet surmises that possibly Ditko actually met with Lee and spoke about his rationale for why this burglar is smiling. On page 11, the comic's previous title of Amazing Adult Fantasy has been replaced by Amazing Fantasy in the bottom caption box artwork. Brevet believes this is evidence the decision to rename the title from Amazing Adult Fantasy to Amazing Fantasy happened after this page was scripted and lettered, but before the original cover drawn by Ditko had been finalized. Now, as mentioned earlier, Amazing Fantasy issue 15 was an anthology that didn't just feature Spider-Man, but also feature such amazing stories as The Bell Ringer, Man in the Mummy Case, and There Are Martians Among Us. All three stories again were written by Lee and drawn by Ditko. They're roughly three to five pages each and really try to tap into the tropes of science fiction and just hysteria in that late 50s to early 60s. But we want to talk a little bit more about The Amazing Spider-Man. Now, we know that the artwork is priceless because there was only one original version of it. However, there are other copies of 
Amazing Fantasy issue 15 when we're talking about the comic book itself. In 2011, a copy of Amazing Fantasy issue 15 set an all-time record price when it was purchased at auction for 1.1 million US dollars. It was graded as a near mint 9.6 CGC. A near mint 9.4 CGC sold for a US $450,000 in 2016 and had been purchased by someone who 35 years earlier had purchased it themselves for $1,200 in 1980. Now, I can't actually tell you the value nor the grading of this edition of the Amazing Fantasy issue 15 propped up next to me. However, I can tell you that it is part of the Ron Graham Science Fiction Collection, housed here within the Rare Books Collection of the Fisher Library at the University of Sydney. The collection comprises of over 80,000 titles, which began in 1974 and was later enlarged during 1979 by the acquisition of the actual Ron Graham Science Fiction Collection, a private collection assembled by Mr. Graham for over 50 years before his death in 1979. The Ron Graham Collection contains almost complete holdings up to 1979 of commercially published American, English and Australian science fiction magazines. It also holds his comic book collection, which has since been added to by other donations and really got me out of a jam and I needed to write my thesis in 2006. But with that, it comes to a conclusion and I want to thank you for taking the time today to come out and listen to me as I speak about Amazing Fantasy Issue 15, The Genesis of Spider-Man. I do encourage you all to continue discovering more about comic books as a medium, either by visiting your local comic book shop or discovering what's available here within the Fisher Library. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Uh, wasn't it today that Spider-Man was kicked out of Marvel, so to speak? I actually planned that. So um, <laughs> just just to help promote. So Marvel still owns Spider-Man as a, as a character, but from my understanding, during the 60s and the 70s, Marvel wanted to start trying to capitalise on some of their characters. So they started making television deals, just selling off the characters, not with an actual script for a TV show or a film, but purely just to generate revenue. During the 1980s, there was a lot of moving of the different rights and what have you. And it ended up with Sony at some stage in the last probably, say, 10 years. So while Marvel owns the character of Spider-Man, they're not actually able to um, have Spider-Man feature in any of the Marvel films without the permission of Sony. So Sony has the agreement with Marvel where Marvel, you can, you can create the film, but we're going to get the revenue of it and we'll pay you a little bit. The dispute that's happened today is Marvel's come back and said, well, actually, we want a 50-50 split because you're leveraging our other IP and that's why you're making a billion dollars. Mind you, the Spider-Man film that just got released is now the uh, highest grossing Sony film of all time. So I can definitely see where both parties are coming from. I think they will come to some kind of conclusion the same way that they did a few years ago when they initially allowed Spider-Man to come into the Marvel Universe. Um, so Spider-Man's about 60 years old. Yes. Um, so how do you account for like, um, so that Spider-Man, Batman, all these heroes um, sort of 60 years, 60 years on and plus still being sort of relevant today and how it's become so popular, how it's passed, so passed generation to generation and um, how comics have become from being a hobby to be a medium? How do you yeah. sort of account for that? Well, I can't speak on behalf of all, of all superheroes, but, <laughs> but in the, I'll give it a good go. Um, with, with a character like Spider-Man, I really think that Lee and Ditko touched upon that everyman aspect, the fact that he 
and I guess it kind of contradicts because of Batman being popular as well, but he wasn't holding a successful job. He didn't have stable relationships. He wasn't making money. He was just, he was just a down and out guy that the reader could read to. And I think that's the kind of story of that every man that everyone can relate to. They can see themselves through the struggles of Peter Parker. And I think television shows like The Big Bang Theory really brought, you know, like geek or nerd culture and stuff like that to the forefront. So, you know, an everyday mainstream audience could relate to it and understand it. Have we hit saturation point? It just feels like there's so many uh, action hero movies at the multiplex now. And just hearing today that the latest Spider-Man is the biggest grossing one of, did you say Marvel? So Sony. 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 Okay. It's still a billion dollars less than Avengers which is Marvel. Okay, do you think, is the end in sight, like, or is it just gonna keep going? Do you think we've got another 10 years of like well, IP that is worth mining? For those of you that reference, Anthony's asking, is there an end game? Now, in my, <laughs> in, 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 in my opinion, there, there will come a point. I don't think we've hit it yet. I think Marvel, as its own studio, hasn't come up with a bomb yet. So they're doing something right. But that's not to say that other studios have tried to do the same thing and it just hasn't resonated with an audience. Now, X-Men, which is part of Marvel Comics, same story. Fox has the rights until very recently. Disney went in and bought Fox for 80 billion US. They released the film very recently, one of their X-Men films, and that, that absolutely bombed. So I think that's more on the writing than the actual character itself. Now, DC Comics tried to emulate this by setting up the Justice League of America with big names, Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, like really your top tier characters in my opinion. And they just got it so wrong. They could have just copied the Marvel template and they would have got it so right. Marvel started their studios in 2008 with Iron Man and Thor, some of the only characters that hadn't been purchased or cannibalized from everybody else. And that was a success. And Iron Man was such a risk that it needed to return you know, enough money so the studio wouldn't go bankrupt, but then they could start bankrolling more films and it worked. So I just think for me, it's, it's in the writing and just understanding the audience that will go and watch the film. And it also sounds almost from that answer, it almost sounds from that answer that it's also if Marvel aren't like if they don't have their hands on it directly. Oh, they, it's they've, they've built up their brand like nobody's business in the past 10 years. And they're the first they're the first uh, studio to actually create like that connected universe. They tried it with um, with a monster universe at Universal and it, and it just flopped. They've tried it with DC and, it, and it's flopped. And they, they're trying to, you know, they're trying to rewrite that at the moment because Wonder Woman was a success, the only real success with, with Aquaman to a degree. So for every one success story, like in everything else, there's about 10 that don't work out. And, uh, as we talk about film production, and although the, like the Marvel Cinematic uh, Universe has been a very pretty successful like, uh, financial uh, like progress in the past 10 years, yeah. and I actually, as a as a comic fan, I'm not very satisfied with uh, with Marvel movies because mm -hmm. they have a tendency of making every movie like comedy. Because uh, in real like real comic wars, mm. there are many genres instead of just comedy. Like they can make make movies more serious yes. or more like um, divinity yes. into the like the religions felt. So, uh, what do you think of or how do you make of the? Well, yeah, the, the like the the. Uh, the disadvantage of the... Yeah, I completely see where you're coming from. And look, to a degree, every time you're making a, you're fighting a, you know, a world-threatening power, you, you're not going to crack a joke. Unless you're Spider-Man who's, who's cracking a joke purely because of nerves. But I think you've got to see it that the audience, if they were to sit through, you know, two hours of constant seriousness, they'd be like, oh, wow. So I think the, the humour does work to try and break up those moments a bit so you can digest something that's very impactful. Oh, I'm going to come down with a joke and then you're going to build it back up. I think, I think it works with Marvel. I think they found that template that they know how to build up the action but then have that little bit of humour. But I, but I completely agree because 
sometimes the jokes don't work and they fall flat when, when you're intended for it to be funny, especially when it doesn't work. It does take you out of that moment where it, you know, there is that, that epic conflict. So I think it's trying to find that balance right. And I like to think for the most part, Marvel has got it right. But I totally agree. If I'm, if I'm stealing the glove off of Thanos, I'm not going to be cracking jokes knowing that I'm going to wipe out all of existence otherwise. I, I do see where you're coming from with that, though. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, you talk about the, the films and stuff and the script, but I also think they actually got the right actors to do it. If you look at who's playing Iron Man Definitely. and Thor and things like that. And I've got to admit, I've reached a kind of saturation point with a lot of these movies. Mm. The actual breath of fresh air for me was actually Guardians of the Galaxy. Mm. I thought that was done very, very well. Mm. I know there was a lot of humour in it, but the thing also that worked in that film was the music, which is interesting. It was quirky because Guardians of the Galaxy, they, they, they came out in, I think, towards the late 1960s. And even then, the characters that you saw on the screen were not the characters in the comic books at the time. That came about with, um, look, I forgot the collaborators' names, but they're collectively known as DNA. And they came together and they were bringing, you know, a talking tree, a talking raccoon, you know, uh, uh, you know a warrior who's green, and brought it together and it, and it made it work. I think what set that maybe apart, apart from the casting, which I definitely agree with, was that you would have seen it otherwise already in the Avengers. So they needed something that was a bit different. And I think, like you said, the music was the unsung hero because it added that personality to the film and it set the tone early on of what the audience would expect which unfortunately did have a lot of jokes in it when they were trying to <laughs> save, save, save the world, you know? But I do agree, I do agree that the casting needed to be right, and they've, they've done it. I mean, they offered Robert Downey Jr. the offer to play Tony Stark when no other studio would touch him at the time, and it, it propelled him to being back in the spotlight where, where he rightly deserves to be. Yeah, oh, definitely, definitely. Not many people can rock long hair or beard and be, you know, six foot, six foot six and look like a Norse god. <laughs> um, do you think comic books are giving more, being given more respect as a storytelling medium this, these days? Um, I've been a fan for a while, but I didn't realise later in life the, like, you know, what you touched upon with um, Stanley and Ditko. Um, the process involved in basically communicating and conveying the story, conveying emotions through words and the combination of words and art in you know, such a finite space. Do you think it's sort of being more, I suppose, um, seen as a, a, a more of a legitimate storytelling method? De definitely, definitely. I think, I think during the 40s and the 50s, it was used just as a form of entertainment. That was before television as well. I think from the 60s you had television, but you, were, you still had a younger audience that were interested in the fantastical so publishers like Goodman, and I, I, I haven't researched a, a lot about him, but obviously he's there to try and make money. But I think with, with DC Comics, it was very much, you had the beginning, save the day, come home, repeat. And that was just the, that was the formula. Stan Lee, collaborating with Jack Kirby, Steve Ditko and others, really tapped into, like I said, that everyman story. You have an incredible Hulk. You've got Bruce Banner, who's got obvious anger issues. You've got uh, Daredevil. You've got Matt Murdock, who's, who's vision impaired, and he's, he's, he's a lawyer. So, you know, it's, it's, it's these everyday stories. They all have their challenges, and they, they were all confronting their own issues. And the readers could relate to it, because they were tapping into that everyman story. I think it became recognised more as an art form or more respective, probably during the 1980s, where, you know, you've got like, um, you know, The Dark Knight Returns and you've got Batman Year One, where, and of course you had like Alan Moore's uh, Watch, Watch, Watchmen, which, which is, in my opinion, the pinnacle, the pinnacle of, of, of comic book, where the artists knew what they were doing and really, really wanted to represent their work really well. Alan Moore was tapping into what was happening in the 1980s and great stories, and it worked well. It was respected, and people, people were like, wow, this is an art form. This isn't just you know, 12 cents, and I'm going to throw it in the bin afterwards. And I think with the emergence of online, with social media, 
people that purchase comic books now, they're, they're, they're critics. They, they are happy to share their opinions. So I think it means that the writers and the artists actually have to up their game because they know they're going to be criticised by, you know, 50,000 people each time they, they put something on the newsstands. Join me in thanking Matthew. Thank you very much.